Good morning, family. Welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church. I am not Pastor Steve Craig. <laughs> but my name is Maria Ross, and I'm one of the ruling elders here. Um, can you believe it? Today, Pastor Steve and his beautiful wife, Lisa, are celebrating his parents' 63rd wedding anniversary in San Diego. 63, can we give them a round of applause? <clears throat> we bless you, Pastor Bill and Mrs. Polly Craig. God bless you, and thank you for setting the bar so astronomically high on what enduring love is. If you are worshiping with us online, we welcome you as well. And please join us in the chat today and let us know you are here. And for all the most up-to-date ministry and program updates, you can sign up for our newsletter at stjohnspres.org. Now this morning, don't worry, I won't also be giving the sermon. We do have a very special guest speaker. Her name is Laura at Water Holiday. Laura, can you stand up for us? Can we give her a round of applause and welcome? <clears throat> and Laura's here with her beautiful husband, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. And her parents as well are here, right? And other family. So welcome, welcome to the Atwater Holiday family. And let me tell you a little bit about Laura. Laura recently graduated with a Master of Divinity with a leadership in ever-changing times concentration from Fuller Theological Seminary. Big brain, big brain. Uh, she works at the Fuller Youth Institute as a project assistant for the discipleship initiatives with Young Adults Grant Project. And she currently lives in Orange County with her husband, Thomas, and their dog, Charlie. Laura is passionate about the next generation and caring for youth leaders. She is the first of three young adults in ministry that we will be hearing from this month in our Emerging Series Leaders. Laura, welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church. Thank you for being here. Now, please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 27. The Lord will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Let us worship God's name together. And now let's, let's read and pray our opening prayer. God of glory, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. You are our shelter in the storm, the lifter of our heads, and in you we can offer the sacrifice of praise with shouts of joy. For you work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We come from a week of joys and troubles, of faith and fears. Help us now to hear your voice and experience your presence, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. For we ask it in the name of Jesus the beloved, our crucified and risen from the dead, amen. Now, please stand and join me as Alexa Borstad, David Kemmer, and Moira Donnelly lead us in worship this morning.
Turn to your neighbor and offering of the Lord's peace. Thank you so much. Good morning, St. John's. Good morning. My name is Nancy Ashley, and I'm the director of Children and Family Ministries. And I'm here to give you a little update on what we're learning in Sunday school. And so uh, we have Sunday school kiddos here, and we are starting to learn about how to shine our light for Jesus. And so uh, last Sunday, we started. And the kids made a sign. And I said, what should we do with this sign? Or I guess they asked me, what are we going to do with this sign? I said, I don't know. We're just going to have it here. And they said, let's take it to church. So here it is at church. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Yes, we're a little bit shy. But um, excuse me. So. Uh, shining bright is our theme, and what we're going to learn. Oh, excuse me. 
One moment, please. There we go. <laughs> Much better. Woo, there they are. So um, last Sunday, the bottom line for us was that you can shine God's light. And we're learning how to be a light on a hill and not cover our light. And this today, we are going to learn about how Jesus fed the 5,000. Use whatever you have to help others because it's all about compassion. And compassion is knowing what someone needs and then doing something about it. And so with that, I'm going to invite all the kids to stick around because we're going to, um, we're going to watch one of our uh, co-Sunday schoolers help with the prayer today, and then we'll be off to Sunday school. Okay, everyone, now we're going to do our congregational prayer. I'd like to welcome the beautiful Nia Wamba. Can we give her a round of applause? <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, it's not easy. As, as much as I've been up here with the microphone, I still get nervous and sometimes sweaty. So can you imagine our beautiful children? They, so, they show so much courage, and I'm inspired by them. So thank you. Thank you, Nia. Um, today is, today's prayer theme is focusing on healing. So I want to start off with some healing scriptures that the Lord brought to memory. Jeremiah 17, 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. 1 Peter 2, 24 tells us, He himself bore our sins as his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jeremiah 33, 6 tells us, Behold, I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. Psalm 41, 3 tells us, The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In him, in his illness, you restore him to full health. That is a promise. And finally, the scripture for today, Psalm 103, 2, 4 tells us, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems you, your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just are so grateful for the ma many ways that you show up for us. <sighs> Forgive us when we forget to ask you for healing. I know I've been guilty of that. Sometimes I just suffer and I forget to ask for help. So thank you for reminding us that you are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. This week, Lord, we like to lift up the ministries, Building Community Commission, our brothers Abraham Ajikwa and Ellery Holdridge. We pray for our members and friends, Sang Mi and Craig Kishi, Silva Kircher, Anthony and Christine King, Bella Rivera, and of course, we pray for mission partners, Faith in Christ Ministries, Mark Lake, and our very own St. John's Presbyterian Church. We can never forget our community of caring. We're praying for all the time-sensitive needs that are listed in our weekly prayer list. We would like to also lift up all of those that are grieving the loss of a loved one. Please, Heavenly Father, comfort them and heal them and assure them of their loved one's place in history, in the kingdom of God. We would be remiss if we failed to mention those that have asked for prayers for their health. That is Christine King, James Combs, Sam Bwamba, Sue Mater, Henry Phillips, Sharon Combs, Rue Pine, 
Violeta Sixnali and family, Nancy Wamba, Vanell Moore, of course, Marcus, Maria, and Naomi Ross, Phoebe Haywood, and Mary Pryor. For those that are out of sight but never out of our hearts, we lift up Alice Zeroni, Marilyn Wilson, Glennis Reason, and Rosine Zyla. In the many ways that our world needs healing, Lord God, and that we ourselves need healing in our lives. From our relational health, to our physical, mental, and emotional health, to our finances. We ask that you have mercy and compassion on us, and that you remember that you love us, and because this is true, then we have the fullness of Christ in us through his Holy Spirit. Help us to experience that healing, not just in heaven, but in this lifetime. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. And now Nia will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. Welcome to church. Um, my name is Laura, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, I was talking with Lyle earlier, and I heard that the heat wave has gotten to you guys. It's been high 80s, low 90s, and quite honestly, from someone who grew up in Bakersfield, that is not a heat wave. <laughs> that is a cool winter day that we all dream of. But I do hope that you're all staying cool in the heat wave. Um, I'm happy to be here. I am friends with Leah Bolton, um, your youth pastor. She uh, goes to Fuller with me. And we also actually went to college together at Azusa Pacific University. We were uh, both one of the few females who were in the biblical studies uh, program. And so she was able to um, invite me to be here today, so I'm so happy that I could be here. Um, yeah, I, as you heard, I just graduated from seminary actually a week ago on Friday, so very fresh, very, thank you, thank you. My husband and I went to um, celebrate at a dinner together, so we have definitely celebrated. I keep going to see how long I can keep these celebrations happening of like, oh, but we have to celebrate. I finished seminary. So this is also a celebration of that. Um, so I'm so happy that I get to be here today. When Leah was telling me about um, her congregation, she described you all as a um, servant-oriented congregation. And so I'm so um, blessed to be able to speak with all of you today. Um, and let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today, for us to gather together in community. God, I pray that you would remove any distractions that are going on, that you would listen to our prayers. God, I pray that you would be here and speak through me to be able to speak to your servant-oriented servants. God, I pray that you would be in this room and that we would be able to notice you in different ways today. In your name we pray. Amen. So two years ago, my husband and I were in a premarital counseling session, and our therapist asked us, what are some different things from your original families that you would like to bring into your new family? And immediately, I thought of two things about my family, and that was hospitality and generosity. My parents are some of the most hospitable people that I know, and growing up, they would always have people over at our house. They even let one of my friends live with them for a few years. They're always opening up their home to anyone and everyone. And since my parents are so generous in hosting people with their home, I always knew that when people were coming over, that meant cleaning. When I was younger, my mom would get stressed out and clean the entire house before guests come over. She would get anxious and need to clean the entire house leading, for days leading up to guests coming over. And I always felt like, I don't really understand this because shouldn't we show, be showing people our authentic lives? Also, I feel like if we went to their homes at this exact moment, they too would have life happening in their house. So I don't really get why we're stressing about this. So maybe your mom was like this too, or maybe you are that person that freaks out about having people come over and cleaning the house. But this is also similar to what we're looking at in our Luke text today. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Luke 10, 38 to 42. Again, Luke 10, 38 to 42. And I am going to be reading from the NRSV translation, starting in verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Most people interpret this passage to be 
about how a life of reflection is way better than an overstimulated life. This is how I grew up to interpret this passage, and for years, this is how I understood it. However, today, I want to suggest that rather than what kind of lifestyle is better, that this passage is actually talking about how to welcome Jesus. Our passage is set um, while Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and in the beginning of the passage, we are introduced to Martha. We are told that she is inviting Jesus into her home, and then we are introduced to her sister, Mary, who has a different way of welcoming Jesus. We are told that when Jesus enters Martha's home, that her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. What Mary does here is countercultural. In Acts 22.3, Paul says that he was brought up at the, in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, educated strictly according to our ancestral law, being zealous for God, just as you are all today. Paul indicates that he was a student of Gamaliel because he sat at his feet. You see, sitting at the feet of a rabbi was a common practice, and that signifies a student or disciple. Four other times previously in Luke, before this passage, we see that those who listen to the word join the path of discipleship. So the phrase that Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying is not simply just saying that she was living a life of reflection. It means that Mary was positioning herself as a disciple of Jesus. What I love most about Mary here is that she didn't ask Jesus if she could sit at his feet. She didn't tell Jesus, I know that I'm a woman and this isn't typical, but I like would really love to sit and listen and learn from you. No, the first thing that Mary does is she decides that she is going to sit at Jesus' feet, no matter what her sister or the male disciples are going to say. Mary assumes her role as a disciple. She had to have known that there would be space for her at the feet of Jesus. Mary isn't being hospitable in the way that her sister expects her to. Mary isn't being hospitable in the way that her culture expects her to. In first, pen, first century Palestine and modern day Palestine, hospitality is allowing the guest to share the sacredness of the family space. The expectation would be that the women would prepare the room, prepare the meal, prepare the space for the guests. Mary isn't being hospitable in the way that her sister expects her to. She isn't being hospitable in the way that her culture expects her to. Not only does Mary decide to act as one of Jesus' disciples, Jesus actually confirms her role as a disciple. He affirms that she has done the right thing and that has actually welcomed him in the only way that matters. Jesus' response encourages a vision that women deserve a spot at Jesus' feet just as much as men do. Now, changing focus, looking at Mary's sister, Martha, Verse 38 specifically identifies the owner of the home as being Martha. In the 21st century, this doesn't feel like a big deal, having this be Martha's home. But this is significant because in first century Palestine, men were the head of the household, and therefore they were the ones that were ascribed a home. So how did Martha become the person to own this home? We don't know, and we might never know. But what is assumed is that she would be able to financially support herself and her home. Martha was busy preparing to serve Jesus, and I can imagine that she was feeling this enormous amount of pressure, knowing that she, being a financially independent woman and owner of the home, is so radical at her time. She must have wanted or needed everything to be perfect for Jesus. In this culture, to, failing to be a good hostess would be to disrespect the guest. I can imagine Martha thinking, if I don't welcome and host Jesus perfectly, I am proving to everyone who thinks I can't do this right. And worse, I am disrespecting my Messiah. She must feel an enormous amount of pressure. And where is her sister? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's response to her sister's actions are suddenly directed towards Jesus. She honestly asks Jesus, 
Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Tell her to go and do what she is supposed to be doing in helping make this a hospitable place for you. Martha's response to her sister isn't to ask her sister questions, but to ask Jesus. She also seems to get almost mad or frustrated at Jesus for not correcting Mary's hospitality. Oftentimes, my, own, my most honest prayers are when I'm questioning God. And the good news is that God doesn't get angry with us when we get angry at God. No, he gently corrects us towards a better way to be in relationship with him. I'll say that one more time. The good news is that God doesn't get angry with us even when we get angry with God. He gently corrects us towards a better way to be in relationship with him. Why doesn't Martha approach Mary herself? Perhaps she's adhering to Jesus' role as rabbi. Maybe Martha is expecting the person with the spiritual authority to address Mary's behavior. Isn't that so common for us to want to tell God how to fix someone else's behavior when they don't align to our expectations? We want God to do something about this, but we aren't willing to go address it ourselves. What I think is so interesting about this passage is that Martha is frustrated with Mary and about how she is attending to their guest, but refers to herself four times. She says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Martha is concerned about how Jesus is going to help her host him. We often think of Martha as this person who is a bit too caught up in life and a little too much letting her anxiety get the best of her. Or we think that she is upset at her sister for breaking cultural gender norms. But this is a shallow understanding of Martha. Martha is likely exhausted that she has, to, has been the sole person holding the burden of hosting Jesus and the disciples. In verse 40, Martha is said to be, quote, distracted by many tasks. The Greek word for tasks here is diakonia. Now, you can all say that you went to seminary and you learned a Greek word. Diakonia. It, a more literal and, I believe, better translation of diakonia is service or ministry. Let me reread that phrase with this in mind. Martha was distracted by her service. Martha was distracted by her ministry. Martha was distracted by her youth group events. Martha was distracted by her church's potluck details. Martha was distracted by getting ready for her small group. Martha was distracted by serving in children's ministry. Martha was distracted by gathering the hospitality team. Martha was distracted by finding emerging leaders for their churches series. <laughs> And I'm not saying that these things are bad. I absolutely believe that we are called to love and serve God's church. But how often are we more distracted by our ministry tasks that we forget to start by listening at the feet of Jesus? How often are we more distracted by what we're doing for Jesus than we forget to welcome Jesus into our lives? If we're not careful, we can create a habit of doing for God more than being with God. I'll say that one more time. If we are not careful, we can create a habit of doing more for God than being with God. We can become human doings rather than human beings. I first felt my call to ministry when I was 16 years old. I was at my church's summer camp, and at the end of the week, the host would always ask people if they gave their lives to Christ to stand up, and the people around them would pray for them. And the next question that they asked was, who decided to go into vocational ministry? And I kind of stood up, like my legs knew what they were doing before my head or my heart knew. And ever since that moment, I have been on this path towards vocational ministry, Ever since then, it's been my favorite thing to study, to talk about, to think about, and I've oftentimes felt more and more affirmed in that calling. I did all of the 
quote, correct career steps. I went to APU with Leah and double majored in youth ministry and biblical studies. I interned at churches. I worked at summer camps. I served in our university's chapel. I was a part of our discipleship groups. I did all of the, quote, right things to be on that path towards vocational ministry. And in 2019, I even landed my very first paid ministry job while also working two other part-time jobs, adjusting to life post-college, and helping my parents with my two grandmothers. But in the summer of 2020, I found myself unemployed, living back home in Bakersfield with my parents, where there was often heat waves, <laughs> and unsure of what my future would look like. It wasn't until I was forced to stop that I realized that I was operating at an unhealthy speed. I was so distracted by my ministry that I had forgotten that my first calling is to be with God, not to do for God. There's a good chance that Martha's home was a house church, like the ones that we see in the book of Acts. It was a place for believers to gather together, similar to church today. This means that part of the hospitality that Martha was preparing was in a church context. This passage brings us two different types of ministry, diakonia and the word. Diakonia is the tasks of ministry. It's the physical act of service, while ministry of the word is spending time with God, reading scripture, or doing other spiritual practices. We are quick to condemn Martha without realizing that we are often more like Martha than we are Mary. We try to tell God, look at my resume of how I have served you. See how many friends that I brought to church. Did you notice how many church activities that I volunteered for? But instead, Jesus reminds us that few things are needed, indeed only one. And Mary had chosen the better part and that will not be taken away from her. My favorite thing about scripture is that it's a living text. The scripture speaks to us today, just as it spoke to first century Palestine. And it pushed against culture then, just as it pushes against our culture. It pushes against our American need to keep producing, keep performing. We believe that we must keep busy, do more, keep pushing. We believe that a spiritual life means volunteering more, attending at church services as much as possible, or showing up to any event. But God doesn't call us to be doers. Rather, he invites us to be beers. Our diakonia ministry must come out of our ministry of the word. It must be derived from our time with Jesus. Our personal relationship with Jesus outpours into our diakonia ministry. Mine was not. I was doing more for God than being with God. And as you reflect this morning, is your service coming from a cup that is full from sitting at Jesus' feet? Or is it coming from this impulse to need to do something, to keep moving? If it's the latter, I encourage you this week to take some time out of your days and spend time with God. Read scripture, go on a walk and pray, Meditate on the word. Pick up a spiritual disciplines book if you need help with other ideas because there are so many different ways that you can spend time with God. It doesn't have to just look like prayer or reading scripture. When you're on a plane, the instructions are to always put on your mask first before helping another person. This is also our relationship with God. We have to be connected to God before we can be, expect ourselves to serve others out of abundance. The gospel reminds us that there is nothing that we need to do to welcome Jesus in our lives. In fact, it is the only thing that we need to do is sit at his feet and listen. And it is when we sit at his feet that we are then allowed to be t pushed out of the way and allow God to work through us in our ministry, in our service. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer as we reflect on God's word today.
As we end our time together, if you would please hold out your hands as I pray this communal prayer for us. Yahweh, forgive us when we are quicker to do acts of service for you than we are to be with you. Remind us, O oh Lord, that our first act as disciples is to sit at your feet and listen. Help us resist the urge to perform and allow us to slow down and be with you this week. I pray that we would be able to sustain our relationship with you, that we would see that our service only comes from our ability and our time spent with you. God, I pray that you would have the word, your words washed over all of us today and that we would love you and others better this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Next, we are going to have our final um, hymn, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus.
you can all sit for a second. I have a couple of announcements. Thank you so much um, before we give the benediction. Um, first of all, Laura at Water Holiday, God bless you. What a beautiful message to remind us of being with the Lord before we can do. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, also, we want to thank you for giving. There are a couple of um, cards in the pews. So if you're, you can either submit an envelope like this, and you can drop it off as you exit the, the sanctuary, or you can give electronically as well. We also want to remind you if you're new to St. John's or if your information has been updated in terms of your contact information, to please fill out one of the communication cards that's in your pew as well. <clears throat> and um, we are still collecting food donations. Thank you so much, Don, for the, the slides on this. Um, so the deacons are still collecting food donations for anyone that's in need. And next week we have our next emerging leader. Um, her name is, um, so sorry, Alexa? Alyssa, Alyssa, yes, Alyssa Spradley. So we're, we welcome her. And of course, Alpha Chorus, um, our brilliant brother in Christ, George Bauer is leading that, and it's in his third week. George, can you raise your hand for all the new people? Please, anybody that has any questions, that is a wonderful ministry, and you couldn't have a better person to lead that. So thank you, George. Alpha Chorus. Um, and also, if you, we are going to be introducing, or Pastor Steve is, going to be having a membership class for how to join, formally join St. John's Ministry uh, Church, and that is coming up. Um, and let's see, after worship prayer by the pulpit today, we're going to have Elder Wendy Appleby and Deacon Donna McBride. Thank you so much for any prayer concern. And I also wanted to mention there is a prayer request card as well in your pews that we have there. So if you have a confidential prayer that you don't feel comfortable speaking with someone directly, then you can put that in there and it will go to the right place and keep your, um, keep that in confidence. So now, I'm sorry. Yes. The welcome group, the welcome group, uh, Melissa couch, you're in the house, right? Yeah. Melissa couch, um, and Janine and, and uh, Brother Aquila and Priscilla, thank you so much. So 12 o'clock, if you would like to, for some fellowship, for some lunch, it's, it's a great ministry. Um, and now for the benediction. You can all, you can all stand for that. Thank you. <clears throat> Now to the one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to that divine power. That is at work within us. To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. I'm sorry, I'm feeling like a priest right now. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.